Let's go to the next topic, unfair labor practices. The term unfair labor practice, or ULP, does not refer to any unfair act or decision of an employer. It refers only to those acts listed in Articles 259 and 260 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Unfair labor practices are acts that violate the right of the employees to self-organization. Without this element of self-organization, the acts, no matter how unfair, cannot be considered as ULP. It will be noted that all the prohibited acts constituting ULP specified in Articles 259 and 260 of the Labor Code of the Philippines are essentially related to the worker's right to self-organization. Thus, an employer may be held liable for ULP only when his conduct affects in whatever manner the right of an employee to self-organize. A dismissal for a just and valid cause is not ULP. This is because the idea of dismissal by ULP is incompatible with dismissal for just cause. Closure of a department due to continued losses is not ULP, even if it results in the termination of union members, because the motive for the closure has nothing to do with the right to self-organization. Dismissal of an employee pursuant to a closed shop agreement is not ULP, because this is one of the matters on which the employer and the union can agree to bring about harmonious relations between them and maintain cohesion and integrity of their organization. Dismissal of a supervisor from organizing a labor organization composed of employees under his supervision is not ULP because a supervisor has no right to organize a union composed of men under his supervision in view of the conflict of interest involved. Who can commit ULP? Number one, employers. And number two, labor organizations. Against whom can ULP be committed? ULP can be committed only against an employee who exercises or has exercised his right to self-organization. The reason is that unfair labor practices are acts that violate the right of employees to self-organization. Therefore, ULP cannot be committed against an employee who, number one, is not connected with any labor organization, number two, has not attempted to join a labor organization, number three, has not assisted or contributed to the formation of a labor organization. Under this principle, ULP cannot be committed against employees who are disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization, like managerial employees or confidential employees who have access to labor relations information. Remember that ULP has two aspects. Number one, the administrative aspect. And number two, the criminal aspect. When can the criminal aspect of ULP be prosecuted. The criminal aspect of ULP can be prosecuted only when there is a final judgment in the administrative proceedings declaring that ULP has been committed. Points to consider. Number one, there must be a final judgment in the administrative case. And number two, that final judgment must declare that ULP was committed. Therefore, the criminal aspect of ULP cannot be filed, number one, without filing the administrative case. Number two, Simultaneously with the administrative case, number three, prior to the finality of the decision in the administrative case, or number four, if the decision in the administrative case does not declare that ULP has been committed. Can the final judgment in the administrative case be used as evidence of guilt in the criminal case? The answer is no. The final judgment cannot be used as evidence of guilt. The reason is the difference in the degree of proof. What is the degree of proof to establish ULP? Number one, for the criminal aspect, it is proof beyond reasonable doubt. And number two, for the administrative aspect, it is substantial evidence. If the final judgment cannot be used as evidence of guilt in the criminal proceedings, what then is the probative value of the administrative judgment? The judgment in the administrative proceedings can only be used as proof of compliance with the procedural requirements for the filing of the criminal case. What is that procedural requirement? That there is a final judgment declaring that ULP has been committed. Who has the burden of proving ULP? It is the complainant who has the burden of proof. Who are criminally liable for unfair labor practice? Only the officers or agents of the business entity and the union officers, members or agents who have participated in 
authorized or ratified the ULP are criminally liable. Note the prescriptive periods of ULP. Number one, for the administrative aspect, it's one year from the commission of the ULP. And number two, for the criminal aspect, it's one year reckoned from the finality of the judgment in the administrative proceedings. The reason is that the prescriptive period does not run during the pendency of the administrative proceedings. Let's go to the unfair labor practices of employers. Interference, restraint, or coercion, requiring an employee not to join a union, contracting out services, assisting in organizing a union, discrimination, dismissing an employee for testifying against the employer, violation of the duty to bargain collectively, payoff for settlement of bargaining issues, and violation of collective bargaining agreement. Number one, interference, restraint, or coercion. How do we determine whether the employer has interfered with, restrained, or coerced employees in the exercise of their right to self-organization? The test of interference, restraint, or coercion is whether the employer has engaged in a conduct which reasonably tends to hinder the free exercise of the employee's right to self-organization. Mere attempt on the part of an employer to curtail or stifle the right of workers to organize or join a union is considered as ULP. Suppose the employer failed to convince employees to desist from their union activities. Can the employer be held liable for ULP? The answer is yes. Success of purpose is not the criterion in determining whether ULP has been committed. Remember the totality of conduct doctrine. The culpability of an employer's remarks should not only be based on their implications, but also against the background and in conjunction with collateral circumstances, such as the history of the employer's anti-union bias or because of an established plan of coercion or interference. The employer's motive is a relevant factor in determining whether ULP has been committed. Subjecting employees to questioning regarding their union activities or their membership in the union constitutes interference in the right to self-organization. Even if the employer will not ascribe a misconduct to the employee, this circumstance alone will not absolve the employer of the liability for ULP if it is established that the misconduct was merely used to give semblance of validity to the dismissal. Number two, requiring an employee not to join a union. An employer commits ULP if an applicant for employment or an employee is required to sign an employment contract which requires him to refrain from joining a union, declare that he is not a member of a union, withdraw his union membership, or resign from his employment if he will join a union. An employment contract which provides for any of the foregoing stipulations is called a yellow dog contract. A yellow dog contract is an agreement which requires a person or employee to Number one, declare that he is not a member of a labor organization. Number two, refrain from joining a labor organization. Number three, withdraw his membership in a labor organization. Or number four, quit his employment upon joining a labor organization. Number three, contracting out services. When will contracting out services performed by union members be considered as ULP? Only when it interferes with, restrains, or coerces employees in the exercise of their right to self-organization. The reason is that contracting out services is an exercise of a management prerogative. The determination of whether services should be performed by its personnel or contracted to outside agencies belongs to the employer. Number four, assisting in organizing a union. Here, remember the concept of a company union. A labor organization, the formation of which has been initiated or assisted by the employer, is called a company union or company-dominated union. But take note that a company union or company-dominated union should not be confused with a company-type union. A company-type union is a kind of labor organization composed of employees in the same company. The mere act of supporting the union or its organizers is considered as unfair labor practice under Article 259D of the Labor Code of the Philippines. The support need not be financial. It can be in the form of special privileges, such as the use of company facilities, preparation of constitution and bylaws, allowing union members and officers to be absent with pay, or giving legal counsel to the union or its members. Note the factor of a prejudicial question. 
in a certification election proceeding where one of the participant unions is charged with ULP for being a company union, the certification election proceedings should be suspended because the complaint for ULP is a prejudicial question. The reason is that to allow the certification proceedings to continue without waiting for the outcome of the unfair labor practice case may result in the election of a company union and its eventual certification as collective bargaining agent. If the company union is certified as collective bargaining agent, the certification proceedings would be rendered nugatory because the company union will be decertified and the employer will be ordered to withdraw its recognition of the union. Number five, discrimination. When will discrimination be considered as ULP? Only when it is intended to encourage or discourage membership in any labor organization. Some cases found that the following situations did not constitute discrimination. Requiring workers who return to work not to destroy company property and not to commit acts of reprisal against the non-striking workers. It's not ULP because the purpose was not to discourage union membership but to ensure peace and order in the company. There was no discrimination if non-union members were given profit sharing to the exclusion of union members who have a different situation from the other members. There was also no discrimination if the employer refused to allow the union members assigned at a warehouse to work as a precaution against sabotage. Finally, requiring returning workers to fill out forms indicating when they will be available for work was not found to be ULP because such requirement was intended not to discriminate but for the company to plan their work schedule. Number six, dismissing an employee for testifying against the employer. When will testimony against the employer be considered ULP? To constitute unfair labor practice under this provision, the testimony should relate to matters that pertain to the exercise of the right to self-organization, such as testimony in another ULP case, an illegal strike case, a labor injunction case, or a certification election proceeding. The reason is that the essential element of ULP is self-organization, considering that unfair labor practices are acts that violate the right of employees to self-organization. In one case, it was held to apply also to dismissal of a brother of the employee. Article 259F of the Labor Code of the Philippines applies not only to dismissal of or discrimination against an employee who has actually given testimony against the employer. It was also held to apply to an employee who was dismissed simply because his brother had testified against the employer. Number 7. What is the meaning of the duty to bargain collectively? The duty to bargain collectively refers to the obligation of one party to sit down in good faith with the other party to negotiate the terms of the collective bargaining agreement. To be liable for the violation of the duty to bargain collectively, the obligation to bargain must exist. Insofar as the employer is concerned, the obligation to bargain collectively will exist only when the union which seeks to bargain collectively with the employer is a legitimate labor organization composed of employees of the supposed employer chosen or designated by the majority of the employees within the bargaining unit as their collective bargaining representative and certified by the Department of Labor and Employment as the collective bargaining agent of the employees. Number one, the union is a legitimate labor organization. This means that the union must be registered with the Department of Labor and Employment or affiliated with a duly registered federation or national union. If the labor organization which seeks to represent the employees is neither registered with the Department of Labor and Employment nor affiliated with a duly registered federation or national union, the employer is not under obligation to bargain collectively with such union because an unregistered labor organization has neither the right nor the legal personality to act as a collective bargaining representative. Number two. The legitimate labor organization is composed of employees of the supposed employer. The duty to bargain collectively arises only between the employer and its employees. Therefore, if the union which seeks to bargain collectively with the employer is composed of employees of the employer's independent contractor, the duty to bargain collectively does not exist because in a valid contracting arrangement, employer-employer relationship is not established between the principal and the employees of the contractor. Number three. The legitimate labor organization was chosen or designated by the majority of the employees within the bargaining unit as their collective bargaining representative. 
if two or more unions claim to hold the majority of the employees in the bargaining unit, the duty to bargain does not exist until the issue on majority representation is finally settled. Number four, the legitimate labor organization was certified by the Department of Labor and Employment as the collective bargaining agent of the employees. This means that the union must undergo the certification process either by request for sole and exclusive bargaining agent or SEBA certification or by certification election. If the union which seeks to bargain in behalf of the employees is not certified as the collective bargaining agent, the employer has no obligation to bargain collectively, even if the union is a legitimate labor organization. Here are examples of violations of the duty to bargain on the part of the employer. Refusal to bargain. This is a violation of the duty to bargain collectively. Deliberately ignoring the CBA proposals. If the certified union sends a CBA proposal, the employer must give a reply or counter-proposal within 10 days from receipt. If the employer totally disregards the proposals without giving the union the benefit of a reply, it may indicate bad faith. Such an act may be construed as a refusal to collectively bargain, hence a violation of the duty to bargain collectively. Negotiating with individual employees on matters of collective concerns. If there is a certified collective bargaining agent, the employer cannot negotiate directly with individual employees or a group of employees on matters of collective concerns. Declaring a lockout without first having bargained collectively. If a union has been certified as the collective bargaining agent, the employer cannot shirk on its obligation to bargain collectively by declaring a lockout. Negotiating on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. If the employer presents a counter-proposal on a take-it-or-leave-it basis, a violation of the duty to bargain is committed because it is not good-faith bargaining. Surface bargaining. This is a situation where a party goes through the motion of negotiating without any intent to reach an agreement or feigns negotiation through empty gestures. This is a violation of the duty to bargain collectively. It is not in consonance with good faith. Dismissing union members to ensure its defeat in the certification election. Unilaterally rescinding a CBA and bargaining with an uncertified union. An employer cannot unilaterally rescind a CBA and enter into a union that has not been certified as bargaining agent. The eighth instance of ULP, pay off for settlement of bargaining issues. The act of paying negotiation fees or attorney's fees to the union or its officers is considered as ULP because it compromises the right of employees to bargain collectively under an atmosphere of freedom and mutual respect. Paying negotiation fees or attorney's fees to the union or its officers is a bribe which could entice the union to follow the wishes of the employer at the expense of the employees whom it represents. And the ninth, when will violation of the CBA be considered as ULP? if the violation is gross in character. What is the meaning of gross violation of the CBA? Gross violation of collective bargaining agreement means flagrant or malicious refusal to comply with the economic provisions. Note the points to consider. Number one, the violation must pertain to an economic provision. And number two, the violation of an economic provision must be malicious or blatant. The violation must pertain to an economic provision. Violation of a non-economic provision of a collective bargaining agreement is not unfair labor practice. It is an ordinary grievance to be threshed out in the grievance machinery established in the collective bargaining agreement. The violation of the economic provision must be malicious or blatant. Honest mistake in interpreting or implementing an economic provision is not an unfair labor practice because it is not malicious or blatant. Differences in interpretation may arise, especially if the stipulation is susceptible to varying interpretation. On to unfair labor practices of labor organizations. Restraint or coercion, discrimination, violation of the duty to bargain collectively, feather bedding, demanding or accepting negotiation fees from employer, and violation of collective bargaining agreement. Number one, restraint or coercion. Here are examples of restraint. A labor organization which recommends the dismissal from employment of an employee who resigned from the union during the freedom period is an example of restraint on the right to self-organization. There is restraint 
because it seeks to deprive the employee of his employment even though the resignation from the union was done during the freedom period. Remember that during the freedom period, a union member is free to exercise his right to self-organization. He may therefore resign from the contracting union or join another union of his choice without being subjected to sanctions because the union security agreement is deemed suspended during the freedom period. If the member is subjected to sanctions under this circumstance, the labor organization commits unfair labor practice for restraining or coercing an employee who exercises his right to self-organization. A labor organization which expels a union member who initiates a petition for audit of union funds is another example of restraint on the right to self-organization, considering that it violates the right of the union members to full and detailed reports from their officers of all financial transactions as spelled out in Article 250B of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Number 2. Discrimination Mere attempt to cause an employer to discriminate against an employee is considered as unfair labor practice. A labor organization commits unfair labor practice when it invokes the closed shop agreement to pressure an employer to dismiss an employee whom it refused to readmit as member without any reasonable ground. Number 3. To be liable for the violation of the duty to bargain collectively, the obligation to bargain must exist. Insofar as the union is concerned, the duty to bargain collectively attaches only when it has been certified as the collective bargaining agent. This means that the union must have been issued a SEBA certification by the Department of Labor and Employment or has been certified as bargaining agent through a certification election. Here are examples of the violation of the duty to bargain on the part of the union. Declaring a strike without first having bargained collectively. If the union has been certified as bargaining agent, it cannot declare a strike without first sitting down with the employer to negotiate a CBA because Article 279 of the Labor Code of the Philippines prohibits a labor organization from declaring a strike without first having bargained collectively. Blue Sky Bargaining Blue Sky Bargaining is defined as the unrealistic and unreasonable demand in negotiations by either or both labor and management, where neither concedes anything and demands the impossible. If the union presents and insists on unrealistic and unreasonable demands, a violation of the duty to bargain collectively is committed because of the absence of good faith. Terminating a CBA prior to the freedom period If a collective bargaining agreement has already been executed, the collective bargaining agent cannot terminate the agreement before the freedom period. Otherwise, it will violate the duty to bargain collectively. Feather bedding Two acts are actionable under this provision. Number one, exacting money or things of value from the employer for services not performed. And number two, demanding negotiation fees from the employer. Mere attempt to exact negotiation fees or things of value for services not performed is considered as unfair labor practice under this provision. According to an expert, the most publicized example of this was the practice of unions in the radio industry where the broadcaster was required to hire and pay for so-called standby bands even if the bands did not perform any service. Demanding or accepting negotiation fees from the employer Two acts are actionable under this provision. Number one, asking for negotiation fees or attorney's fees from the employer. And number two, accepting negotiation fees or attorney's fees from employer. If a labor organization asks an employer to give negotiation fees or attorney's fees, it is guilty of unfair labor practice regardless of whether the proposal was accepted by the employer. If the employer agrees to the proposal and gives negotiation or attorney's fees to the labor organization, then it is equally guilty of unfair labor practice. If the labor organization did not ask for negotiation fees or attorney's fees but nevertheless accepted such fees from an employer, and it is still guilty of unfair labor practice. And violation of collective bargaining agreement. To constitute ULP, the breach of collective bargaining agreement must be gross in character, that is, flagrant and or malicious refusal to comply with the economic provisions of the collective bargaining agreement.